I'd like to read uh, James chapter 4, verse 1. If we have the message, translation or paraphrase. James 4, verse 1, it says, this is from the message. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to get your hands on it. Verse 2. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're spoiled children. It's wanting your own way. It's wanting your own way. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in His way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that God is fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you will find. I like that last statement where it says, and what God gives in love is far better than anything else you will find. I started with these verses because these verses tell us or show us the true picture of what is going on in the world today. And please don't interpret this politically, because it's not just going through what the world looks like today. Troubles, from the scriptures here it says, troubles come when people, when families, when organizations, cities, nations, when they want their own way. When people think of themselves only when, that's why wars happen, it says, when quarrels happen. When we think that God does not care, that's what the scriptures say, when we think God doesn't care, and so we try to solve our own problems without Him, without God. So from where comes war and quarrels and all of that? It comes from that kind of attitude when we want to do it our own way, when we think God doesn't care and we try to solve it our way. Now, as a background, I'd like to approach this subject of love kind of differently. First of all, I'd like to go to the story of Jesus who came from Nazareth and went to Galilee and he was baptized by John. You know the story, right? He went there and was baptized and as Jesus was coming out of the water I can picture that he was coming out of the water he saw heaven torn open the heaven and skies open and the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my son whom I love with you I am well pleased. That is in Mark 1, in case you want to check. Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. For the Spirit of God here to be pictured as a dove, for us today is not particularly striking because, you know, we've read this so many times, this story, and okay, yeah, okay, that's the Holy Spirit, like, like a dove. It may not be striking, but for Mark, who was writing this, the context, it was very rare. When he wrote this, because in the sacred writings of that particular time in Judaism, there was only one place where the Spirit of God is likened to a dove. There's only one place that's likened to a dove, and that is in the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so Mark used that one example in that Targum, or the Aramaic translation and it says in Genesis 1-2, this is what it says that Mark is using. 
in the creation of the world, of the heavens. Genesis 1-2 says that the Spirit, this is the Aramaic, that the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. The Hebrew verb here means the word is flutter, F-L-U-T-T-E-R, flutter. The Spirit, it says, fluttered over the face of the waters. So, so to capture and to imagine that vivid image, the rabbis translated the passage in the Aramaic like this. And the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. Now I have reasons why I quote that, probably the same as Mark. See, there are three in this, this character here that are active in the creation of the world. There is God, there is God's spirit, and God's word, through which creation happens. The same three are present in Jesus' baptism, and that was being made clear by Mark. The Father, who is the voice, this is my son, you know, the father speaking. And of course, Jesus, the son, who is the word, and the spirit fluttering like a dove. So when Mark used this fluttering dove, he had a reason. Mark is deliberately pointing us back to the very beginning, the creation, to the very beginning of history. And just as it was in the original creation of the world, that was a project, a work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Mark says, and so is the redemption of the world, the rescue, the renewal of all things. That is the beginning. The arrival of Jesus is also a mission of the triune God. And that's what Mark is doing here with this picture of Jesus' baptism. God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working as one from creation to the creation of man to the redemption of man through Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working. And why is it important for us to understand that creation and redemption are, are the products of the triune God, one God in three persons? So when Jesus comes out of the water, and he came out of that water, the Father embraces him, envelopes him, in, and covers him with these words of love from the Father. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And meanwhile, the spirit like a dog flutters and, and covers him with his power. And this is what is happening. That, that kind of relationship is what is actually happening in the interior life of God, Father, Son, Spirit. So Mark is giving us a, a vignette or a glimpse of the very heart of the reality of God, the very meaning of life in God, the essence of the universe. And according to the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they glorify one another. And Jesus says in his prayer recorded, recorded in John, it says in John 17, verse 4 to 5, to support that, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. This is the working. It's good for us as we try to understand what love is all about, the true life and what it is, that essence in the very character of God himself. Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. This is something that is going on. This is us. The love relationship is there. It's person of the Trinity. Even the word person is not even enough to describe Father, Son, Spirit. But the three glorifies one another, they love each other. Now in the words of one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, quote, he said, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, 
pulsating activity, a life almost kind of a drama. You know, when I was young, when I closed my eyes and imagined, I, you know, I was born Catholic, grew up Catholic, I imagined God in a marble throne, gray hair, you know, looking down, just kind of static and waiting for our prayers. But, but C.S. Lewis said, no, it's different. It's, there's this pulsating, dynamic relationship, almost, if you will, is, uh, C.S. Lewis said, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of a dance, that kind of relationship. The persons within God exalt its other, commune with its other, and defer to one another. Its divine person, C.S. Lewis says, harbors the others at the center of his being. In constant movement of overture and acceptance, it envelopes and encircles the others. God's interior life, what is who God is, therefore overflows with love and regard for the others. That is the reality of God's life. But humanity has turned the wrong way. Hence, James said at the beginning, that's where wars, quarrels, hatred, prejudice, all these troubles that we have. We, as humans, have forgotten or don't even know who God is. We have gone the way of self-centeredness. And self-centeredness, as we read in James, destroys relationship. There's nothing that makes man miserable than self-absorption. How am I feeling? How am I doing? How are people treating me? How am I proving myself? Am I succeeding? Am I failing? Am I being treated justly? Self-absorption leaves us in a static way where the focus is the self. And there's nothing more disintegrating that more than self-centeredness. Why do we have wars? In James it asks that. Why do we have class struggles? Family breakdowns, sibling rivalry? Why are relationships collapsing and breaking? It is the life outside the life of God. It is the darkness of self-centeredness. When we decide to be on our own center, when we decide to be our own king, let me be the one to drive the car, let me be the one to sit on the throne, everything falls apart. Physically, socially, spiritually, and psychologically. When we become self-absorbed, we live the dance. We have left the dance that is going on with Father, Son, and Spirit that overflows and invites us. We are not in harmony. We are not in steps with what is happening in the very life of God. But God is different. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are pouring love and joy and, and adoration into the other. It's one serving the other. They are infinitely seeking one another's glory. And so God is infinitely happy. And if it's true that this world was created by God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, then the ultimate reality really is this beautiful dance kind of, it's a metaphor, relationship. So C.S. Lewis writes here, what does it matter? It matters more than anything else in the world. He said, this whole dance or drama or this pattern of this three personal life is to be played out in each one of us. It's to be lived in each one of us. This joy, this, this peace, this eternal life. There are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting at the very center of God's reality, Lewis said. So why does Lewis choose to dwell on the image of the dance why is that important a self-centered life is a static stationary life which is not an image of god for god created man in his own image because god is relational 
And the same, th same thing with us. We are relational beings. And self-centeredness is so much against that very image of who God is. You know, if we think that human beings should revolve around us, you know, everybody here come up in the stage and we all, we need to go and dance, but everybody says, hey, you go around me, you go around me, it's going to be a mess. You know, there's, that is not what it is. Self-centeredness makes everything else a means to an end. We begin to use people. We begin to do things. I mean, I can even be wrong and serve the homeless if that will, if I think that makes me look good. If the things that we do is all about self-centeredness, that is not who God is. The triune God is different. So instead of self-centeredness, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are characterized by their by the essence of their mutual giving of love. No one in the triune God, no one insists that the others revolve around him. Nobody. Rather, each of them voluntarily orbits around the others, being a part of that dance. And it is in that reality that God made us human beings to be in the image of God, that we in the same way will act like that. And that is made possible through Jesus, through the Spirit that makes possible Jesus. So God, from the very beginning, the scriptures even tell us that that's God is love. He created us so that, not that he gets love. He created us so that he can give his love. From creation to the redemption, all that God does was to love us, to love humanity. And we are created in that image. So he invites us to allow him to love others in our lives, just as he had compassion when Jesus Christ came for everyone. We too, God's people with Christ in us, lives with this life of compassion and love for others. I don't have to go through all the scriptures, but there's a lot. Um, Matthew 25 says also that when you do this, when you visit the sick, when you go to the prison, all this that like Christ, you've done it to me. When you love others, you love me. In Leviticus 19, 33, 34 says, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So there, there, I look at this. There are so many scriptures. Proverbs 14, 31 says, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker but he who is generous to the needy honors him so many scriptures and all the scriptures reveal to us that this is the very god and, and when we understand who god is when we love others it is not us doing that ministry but we actually participate in what the father son and holy spirit have been doing from the time of creation through redemption we participate in that dance but when we forget and we become self-absorbed, we step out of that dance. And that's where troubles come. But there's another particular scripture I'd like to end, and that is in Mark, Mark 2, 1 to 5. There's more to God's love than more than just doing or helping in a physical way. God cares not only for our present situation, not only for our physical well-being, but he cares for something more. And in Mark 2, 1, 5 is the story of the paralytic healed by Jesus. That there's something more to give. And that is the forgiveness of sin. But in fact, Jesus knows something that this man doesn't know. He was paralytic. You know, we don't have to go through all that, but you know the story. He was paralytic. And then they had to open the rooftop, right, to get in. And then, when, and then Jesus saw him and Jesus said, not just focus on the healing of the paralytic, but he said, your sins are forgiven. In a sense, Jesus Christ was telling him, and he is also telling us, I understand your problems. I see your suffering. I, I, I get that. I know that. But please realize that the main problem in a person's life 
It's not really his physical suffering, it is his spiritual problems, his own sin. That's what he's saying. Christ cares about our health, but he cares more about our own destiny, our spiritual lives. The main problem in our lives is that we forget that, you know. So love, in this case we can sum summarize, the love of God, yes, he cares for us, but he also cares for the well-being, the spiritual well-being of people. So we serve. We serve others, not just to help them, give them clothing or food, but we also care for their need for Jesus. And that is the depth of, of how Jesus approached this, and that is the depth of God's love. And that is an amazing thing for us to understand that when we go out there and serve the world, when we go out there and share the gospel, we are actually joining in the dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are in harmony and we dance with joy and gladness. But when we become self-absorbed, we go out out of step. And that's what James says, from where troubles come in war, when we go out of God's harmony. Amen. Amen.